Hi everyone, Stepan here. Uh, today I'm going to finish the series on the Queen's Gambit Declined with the Cambridge Springs variation or the Cambridge Springs Defense or just the Cambridge Springs. Uh, one of my favorite ways to play the Queen's Gambit Declined, uh, although you could say this is also a way to play the Semislav Defense, as we are going to see. So the Cambridge Springs is a counter-attacking idea uh, with this move Queen to A5, very aggressive in its nature and quite unlike the other things we have seen in the Queen's Gambit uh, declined variations. So a bit about the opening first. Uh, the, the Cambridge Springs variation was first played by none other than Emmanuel Lasker in his game against Hodges in 1892. We are going to have a look at that game briefly. Uh, so a very old defense. Uh, it became popular in the early 20th century. The name Cambridge Springs comes from a town in Pennsylvania called Cambridge Springs. And the variation was named after a tournament played there in 1904. And it was played several times. Uh, so it's quite... Uh, it's quite a popular defense, but it's not one of the main lines uh, on the on the highest levels. Its period of greatest popularity was 1920s, 1930s, and it was played at the World Championship matches. Elekain used it uh, versus Capablanca. Uh, Elekain and Bogoljubov both played it in their match in the 20s. Uh, Juve played it uh, against Elekain in their match. So it was played during the 20s and 30s by the best players. And recently, or recently after the beginning of the 20th century, some of the main exponents were Bogoljubov and Spielmann. And lately, uh, well, well, very recently, it was played by Ivanchuk, Yusupov, Gurevic, uh, Kasparov played it, Smyslov played it in the 70s, 60s, 70s. So <clears throat> it's not an opening that people didn't play on the highest level. So this is the position, how do we enter it? So we have d4, d5. First, I'm going to show you how to enter it from the Queen's Gambit declined. c4, e6, Queen's Gambit declined. Knight to c3, knight to f6, bishop to g5, one of the main moves. And now black continues with this tricky move, knight b to d7. Well, tricky move, simply reinforcing the f6 knight. Uh, still, of course, you could play bishop to e7, you could go into the orthodox or some of the other lines. And here white could either play knight f3 or e3, more common is e3. And black simply continues with the move c6. And after knight to f3, we now have a weird semislav where black has uh, played knight b to d7 after bishop to g5, which is uncommon, as we are going to see. And in this position, uh, we have the move queen to a5. Uh, the move queen to a5 is the Cambridge Spring defense. Now, what's the idea? The idea is you want to unpin on f6. So basically, this bishop isn't as powerful anymore. Uh, you want to counterattack and use the sort of Nimzo Indian idea to pin on c3 to exert pressure on white's position. So if you could imagine black having two more moves, something like bishop to b4 and knight to e4, or knight to e4 first, would be absolutely devastating. So that's the idea. White has to react. Another very important thing in this position, apart from the pin, is the pin on the bishop. So if uh, a piece moves, and one of the main moves, moves is knight to d2, uh, then the bishop is hanging. Also, if black manages to play the move knight to e4, then the bishop is hanging after something like d, to c, d takes c4, because the bishop is attacked twice. So let me just show you one way to blunder this position before we get into the sound moves. So this move has been played, people have lost games like this. Queen to c2 is okay in itself. And now knight to e4 using the pin on the knight. And let's say white blunders here with bishop to d3, simply trying to win a pawn. Uh, well, uh, in this position black simply wins a piece. Knight takes bishop, knight takes bishop, and d takes c4. Wins either the knight or the bishop, white has to choose, but basically the position is lost. So the position is quite tricky. After queen to a5, if white doesn't know what he is doing, he could be lost quickly. Now let me show you how to enter this from the semi-slav. So c6, uh, the slav defense, knight to f3, knight to f6, knight c3, e6, bishop to g5. This is the second most popular move in the semi-slav, more popular is e3. And in this position, players with black play h6 those who play the semi-slav. This is just more popular. You could play bishop e7. You could also play knight b to d7, which leads to the Cambridge Springs. In this position, there's simply nothing better, I'm sorry, than e3 for white. Now, I've played this position with black when I was starting out. One of my first games, 
was bishop to e7. Bishop to e7 before knight b to d7. But I basically played this. And this is now a very favorable semi-slab for white because he got his bishop out and he played e3. The way to try and punish that is to play the Cambridge Springs. So this is more of a semi-slav uh, way to play for black than Queen's Gambit declined. But it's considered a variation of the Queen's Gambit declined nevertheless. Okay, after queen to a5, we are going to be looking at two main moves for white. Uh, the main sideline after queen to a5 is the move c takes d5, which resolves the issue of the pawn and tries to open up the center immediately, and the main move knight to d2. Uh, let's start with the sideline, but before uh, we get into that, I'm just going to show you a couple of mistakes. So, this position is tricky if you don't know what you're doing. So, for example, if white plays the very natural bishop to d3, well, very natural looking, then d takes c4 using the semi-slav idea of capturing on c4 after, after the bishop has moved. Bishop takes c4 and knight to e4 is already better for, for black. And it's not winning, but it's much better. So the bishop is attacked twice. You are obviously losing material. If you don't move the bishop, you lose the bishop. If you move the bishop, you lose a pawn. So bishop to h4, and you don't have to take immediately. You can go b5 first, which is the most active. Bishop d3 or bishop e2, doesn't matter. And now knight c3, pawn c3, queen c3 check, knight d2, and it's clear that black is just uh, a pawn up. Another mistake after the Cambridge Springs, for example, if bishop to e2 is played, well, then again, uh, you can go knight e4, you can take on c on c4. Knight e4 is more accurate. Again, attacking the bishop. Uh, the bishop should move, uh, but that would be quite risky because then you lose uh, on c3. So castles is the main move, simply giving up the bishop for the bishop pair. So knight takes, knight takes, and now d takes c4, attacking the knight and gaining the tempo here. So the pawn cannot be recaptured. The knight has to go back. And now after b5, black is again a simply simply a pawn up. Inaccurate moves do exist, which don't lose material immediately. One of them is queen to b3. You simply continue knight e4, and after c takes d5, which is basically forced, again, a move like bishop to d3 would be terminal, uh, take the bishop and win. So you have to basically play c takes d5 to stop d takes c4. And now you can go knight takes g5, uh, knight takes g5, and simply e takes d5. You have opened up your bishop, you have no problems here, something like bishop d3, h6, knight of 3 bishop d6, and black is at least comfortable, if, if not better, after castles, castles. So, returning back to the main position, there are mistakes white could make. The main problem black has is a common problem in the semi-slav, and uh, the queens can be declined. You have blocked in your bishop on c8, you have to do something about it. The idea is, well, you are going to play either c5 or uh, e5 or c5, as always. In some positions, you go b6, bishop b7. But you are start, starting a counterattack and not giving white enough time to react. Okay, the main sideline, c takes d5, gives you the option to liberate the bishop immediately with e takes d5. That's, however, slightly inaccurate. If you go e takes d5, then the move bishop to d3 and knight to e4 uh, can simply be met by castles. Uh, it's not such a big deal, just castles. And if knight takes g5, well... Uh, knight takes g5, knight takes g5, knight to f6, the position should be equal. And after castles, if knight takes c3, then let me turn on the engine for this one, actually, because I couldn't believe how much better white was. b takes c3, uh, taking on c3 leads to immense issues, a winning position for white, because, well, you have allowed white to open the center up with e4. The bishop is still on the board and this is very scary. There's basically no way to save yourself here after e4. If you take, well, rookie one is coming. If you don't take, then white could take and rookie one is coming. And basically, if you play bishop e7, white is going to take. If you play bishop d6, then rookie one is very powerful. So after castles, uh, white is fine. c3 is not hanging. So knight takes g5 is the best option. As I said, the position is equal. But you don't want this, because after knight g5, knight f6, h3, bishop d6, something like e4 can be played again while your king is in the center. d takes e4, knight takes e4, knight takes e4, knight takes e4. Have to go bishop e7, but now bishop c4. And once you castle, these pieces are very active. So even though your bishop is opened, you don't want to do that. The main move 
after c takes d5 is taking with the knight. And you're going to sort your bishop out later. Uh, that can be done later. And of course, if uh, white now unpins and takes on d5, then you will gladly recapture with d e pawn, open up your bishop. This would be a horrible mistake, but uh, that's not going to happen. You're going to have to work to get your bishop out. Queen to d2 now, finally unpinning, and bishop to b4. Another attacker comes into play on c3. Rook to c1, you have to defend. And now h6, chasing the bishop away, bishop to h4, and now c5. This is the idea. You open up your bishop by allowing it to go to c6 via d7. And you can also, in some positions, play b6, bishop, b7, which in this variation is more common, but any will do. And basically, once you play c5 or e5, you have liberated your bishop, you have no issues. A3, the downside is, well, you give up your good bishop. Bishop takes c3, of course, b takes c3, not giving up an exchange. And now you continue b6 and go bishop c7. Bishop b7. c4 by white is the most active move. Uh, your queen is attacked, so moving the knight would ruin your pawn structure and also, well, ruin your pawn structure. So takes. Knight takes, and knight to e7 is the more popular move, although knight f6 can be played. But if knight f6 is played, then there could be some issues after d takes c. And of course, d takes c, you would like to take with the knight, but if you take with the knight, well, this is not this is not a good pawn structure. So therefore, after knight takes, uh, knight takes d2, you play knight e7 to stop those tricks. Now, if dc, then of course, knight takes c5. f3 uh, gives a retreat square for the bishop. And after something like bishop b7, bishop e2, g5, bishop f2, f5, f5 castles, king f7. The position is equal. Uh, it's quite tense still. There is a lot going on in the center. White would, of course, like to advance further with d5, if possible, also with e4. Therefore, black's f5, g5 makes a lot of sense. White, of course, doesn't want to take on c5, improve black's knight. Black is going to have natural development, rook h to d8, rook a to c8. White is going to go rook f to d1, and a very, very pleasant position for both sides. The bishop pair isn't as powerful. I think it's important that black has a light squared bishop. His dark squared bishop isn't, of course, wouldn't be obsolete in this position, but it wouldn't be as powerful because of all of these pawns. And it's not clear that white's dark squared bishop is doing that much. So this is the sideline that white could go for after the Cambridge Springs c takes d5. I wouldn't recommend that for white because I truly believe uh, black has no issues. So now let's let's go over the main line. So after queen a5, the main line is knight to d2, and this move simply unpins the knight, which is very important. Also very important controls e4. So if knight e4, then knight e4 takes, and white is simply better. This would of course be dreadful for black. This is just a very strong center for no compensation, queen d2 and then f5 would have to be played horribly. So after knight to d2, uh, white has two options, black, I'm sorry, has two options, either dc4 uh, or bishop b4. dc4 is very direct, uh, once you take, you are basically attacking the bishop, so knight c4 would lose, bishop c4 would lose, so for the moment you have, you have won a pawn. Of course, if if white doesn't want to give up his bishop pair, if he plays bishop h4 or bishop f4, then things get very simple for black extra pawn. Thank you very much. 3 to 2 pawn majority on the queen side and black should be better. So bishop h4 is not an option. So after knight to d2, d takes c, you have to do something about the bishop. The only way to save the pawn or to be able to recapture the pawn is to take. So to play a forcing move, bishop takes f6. Now in the game we are going to look at uh, Lasker's game. Well, we are going to see. Uh, the move that should be played is, of course, knight takes f6. And now knight takes c4, regaining the pawn with tempo. It's also more useful to get the knight into the center than to castle quickly because it's tempo on the queen. Queen c7. Now bishop to e2. You need your bishop here because of knight g4 ideas. Bishop to e7, castles, castles, rook to c1, normal position. Uh, nothing really going on in here except for black's bad bishop. Uh, you might say to compensate for that, black has the prospects of having a good bishop pair, but that has to be accomplished. So for the moment, this is not possible. This is, 
well hardly possible if you go b6 then your c6 pawn is weak this look is this rook is lined up with the queen so let's see what black does about that first of all rook to d8 developing into the center looking at the queen making c5 and e5 more powerful queen to c2 therefore are pinning uh, bishop to d7 preparing to be able to play bishop c6 after the move c5 and now knight e5 is very active uh one of the most active moves and even though the bishop is bad for the moment, leaving it for white to take it wouldn't be good because uh, white's light squared bishop would be unopposed and this diagonal could become uh, quite weak and of course uh, you would have nothing to defend the light squares anymore. So bishop to e8 is the main move. I'm not saying that it would be losing to do that but it's just better to retreat the bishop. Bishop to d3 getting onto the diagonal and now we can play c5 of course taking loses the knight. So knight to e4, trying to weaken the h7 square is the main move. You have to take, uh, because otherwise c5 is hanging, uh, so takes. Bishop takes, and now you have problems on h7. So playing a normal move would, well, lose a pawn, so you go f5. And after f5, bishop to d3, uh, something like queen to d6, getting away from this pin, is going to be fine for black. You have, of course, weakened your e6 pawn, but this guy is still here, so there are defensive moves to, to play against this. Trading of this knight is also an option. You have the dark squared bishop, white doesn't, so taking is going to basically eliminate your worst piece for, for his good piece. Again, he doesn't win a pawn because uh, taking would lose the knight. If takes with the queen, uh, wait, let me just check this. If takes with the queen, this is much better. Oh, ah, yeah, I'm sorry, the bishop is hanging. I'm sorry. I have not checked this in advance, but yeah, you, you cannot take with the queen because it takes twice. And, well, hmm. I'm sorry about this again. So, takes, rook takes. Yeah, you give up the exchange. You give up the exchange. Of course, it's not that the bishop is hanging, but that you would have to recapture with the rook. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so uh, the main line with knight to d2. Uh, can be met with dc by black, but I believe that the main move is more principled. The main move is bishop b4, simply increasing the pressure on c3 and, well, putting on your, all your forces on, on white's queen side. Queen to c2, trying to defend black now finally castles, uh, bishop to e2, and now uh, there are a couple of moves you could play here. The obvious thing that both sides have to be aware of at all times is the loose bishop on g5. So one candidate is simply dc again. Uh, dc in this case again should be met because it wins a pawn by bishop takes f6. So we have the same idea. Knight takes f6 and now knight takes c4. Pretty similar to dc uh, very early on instead of bishop b4. Something like queen c7, castles and again we are going for b6, bishop b7. So look a c1. Bishop b7, bishop to f3, and rook a to c8, and the fine position. You want to play c5 uh, as black liberate your position. Your f6 knight is great controlling these two squares. You don't really mind giving up this bishop because you already are a dark squared bishop up, and that's fine. So after bishop to e2, dc is not one of the main moves. Of course, if your opponent blunders, then great, but nobody's going to blunder that. The two main moves are c5 and e5. E5 is a sideline. The idea behind both is to give your bishop some squares. So E5. Castles. Uh, white is not really afraid of this or of this. So black takes, which is the best move, but it's not bad for white. ED4. Here you can recapture immediately, but knight B3 is much better. Uh, gaining a tempo on the queen and taking with the knight. Uh, after queen to B6, uh, E takes D4. Uh, can be played, but then d takes c4, bishop takes c4, gives white an isolated queen spawn. So after queen b6, knight takes d4, is better, bishop takes c3, b takes c3, uh, should be played. Of course, if queen takes c3, then knight e4 wins the bishop, so note that. So after knight takes d4, bishop takes c3, don't take with the queen, you lose a piece, so b takes c3, and now d takes c4, and the position is, well, solid 
for for black black even has a slightly better pawn structure for the moment the pawn up but bishop takes c4 of course is possible and yeah four to three for white on the king side which isn't as important and black as black's three to two but still should be should be quite equal in this position of course white is the one with the bishop pair hence compensation for for the ring structure so the move e5 leaves you in a position where you still have to work to develop your bishop and it's just more principled to play the move c5. This is a sort of Tarash, uh, Nimzo Indian idea, and Nimzo Indian Tarash sort of setup, where black has a bishop on b4 and strikes at the center. Uh, white should castle, that's simply the best move. Uh, and now cd4. Again, knight to b3, the same idea is best, queen to b6. And ed4 or knight d4 can be played in this position, ed4. Uh, is considered to be better. Uh, of course, if uh, black does nothing, then c4 could be devastating. So d takes c, bishop takes c4, and now queen to c7, attacking the bishop, and white is left with an IQP position, which is incredibly active. Uh, you might think that this is a structural deficit, but white has a lot of compensation for this position firstly his light squared bishop is a monster compared to the c8 bishop secondly there will be pieces coming into the position and there is no pin on f6 but the knight on d7 is sort of restricted because if it moves bishop takes f6 uh, and on the other hand the the knight on f6 doesn't really have that many good squares of course if you play knight d5 then you too have an isolated queen spawn for no apparent compensation White's best and most active move is queen to e2, not only to defend the bishop, but to get the queen closer to these squares. Bishop takes c3, uh, b takes c3 to reduce some of the pressure to increase the control over the e4 and the d5 squares. And now h6 chasing the bishop away, bishop to h4 and knight to d5. In this position knight to d5 is simply the best move. Uh, you don't have time to prepare this with rook to d8 or b6 bishop b7 you don't have time so you accept this and there's an advantage to this trade you are stopping c4 and c3 is now a backwards pawn which is an easy target an easy target is maybe too harsh but it's a pawn that black could target ideas that come to mind are of course knight b6 knight c4 to, to blockade the pawn get your bishop to the most active diagonal and simply try to round this guy up. Uh, all in all, equal material and chances for both sides, but I would rather be black here. And this is the main line of the Cambridge Springs. This position uh, hasn't ne has never been reached. Uh, I have went, I have gone a bit too far, but queen c7, queen e2, bishop takes c3, b c3 has been played 10 times. Knight e4, queen e4 was uh, the, the main move chosen by grandmasters. After bc3 though, I think h6 is, is a more precise move. h6 has been played once by Gerasimov Vladimir Nikolaevich. Uh, h6 is simply a move that provokes the bishop to move, so why not interpose it? So all in all, the Cambridge Springs is a very fun variation to play. I think it's a very direct way to say, well, I'm not having a passive position, I'm not allowing you to develop normally. I'm going to put pressure on you as soon as possible. Okay, let me know what you think. Uh, I'm sorry, before we finish, I'd just like to show, briefly show the, the game in which this variation was first ever played. So this is Albert Hodges versus Emmanuel Lasker, uh, way back at the end of the 19th century. Knight f3 by Hodges, d5, d4, knight f6, c4, e6, now we have a normal queen's gambit declined. Knight b2, d7, e3, c6, knight c3, a slightly different move order, and Lasker went for queen a5. If whether he knew this was a variation or not, I'm not sure, I didn't think he has, because this is the first time it was played officially, but maybe he had prepared it. In this position, his opponent took on f6, which is also an option today. It has been played about a hundred times, so resolving the issue of the bishop, but it's not as popular. Knight takes f6 is the normal move, of course, played today. Lasker went gf6. And he was busted in this game. So a3, dc4 played, uh, bishop takes c4, queen to h5, fine, seems aggressive, but bishop e2. Queen to h6 played, and in this position white played g3. g3 is a weak move, g3 is just a weak move. The game continued g3, bishop e7, queen c2. The very aggressive continuation was g4, and there's simply no good response to this. If you look at the black queen, 
it's kind of restricted and it's not clear what it's doing here so if you go queen g6 then of course bishop to d3 uh, and this move really does restrict the queen so let's say bishop to e7 h4 and it's not easy it's not easy to defend this knight b6 is in my analysis something you can afford and after rook to g1 you can go queen to f8 and try to retreat your queen that way but this is just a very passive placing for the queen something like queen b3 and white is obviously better there is no question about that the black king is ridiculous in the center and white is going to go g5 and just try to win so this is what his opponent should have played instead of that after queen h6 he went g3 which is ah, just a weak move uh, bishop b7 queen c2 b6 h4 bishop b7 rook g1 also not too precise much better was probably to just castle and start an attack and after something like queen g6 offering a queen trade e4 and again white should have a close to winning advantage this is just too too scary for black but instead rook g1 a6 rook d1 rook c8 uh, queen to d2 uh, rook to g8 and for some reason lasker's opponent chose to keep his king on e1 which makes no sense e4 and you keep your king on e1 and play e4. Queen d2, Lasker was probably happy to trade queens. Rook takes d2 and rook to d8. King to f1. And from this position on, it's equal. I mean, it's complicated. Both sides could mess up. But basically, Lasker got away with it. He has the bishop pair and has a slightly better position, actually. Slightly safer king because of the f-pawn. And the f-pawn is quite useful, blocking the white knight out of these squares. So the game continues. Bishop d6, g4. Lasker gets into the dark squares, white evicts him, Lasker blocks, uh, still you can see the importance of controlling these two squares, so he doesn't really want to move either of the pawns ever. Bishop to c2, knight d7 and outing his knight, f4, aggressive, but just knight b6, getting into the weaknesses, and bishop a7, and this is, this is a very nice move, bishop a7 is nice, getting the getting the bishop to the best possible diagonal king to f2 and now a bit of tactics c5 uh if if the pawn is taken then of course something like knight c4 could be played which is very aggressive king f3 instead c takes d4 rook takes d4 knight to c4 a tactical move and now rook d to g1 giving up an exchange for no apparent reason and well, from this position on Lasker won easily. But it's fun to see the first game in which this was played and how his opponent recognized the problem with the bishop, so took immediately, and Lasker for some reason took with the g-pawn, which I don't understand. Since the idea of the Cambridge Springs is to be able to play knight e4, this is just a must-play move, not only because it doesn't ruin your pawn structure. In many semi-slav positions you take with the g-pawn because it's justified, but here you want your knight on e4 anyway, so, so yeah. So this is the premiere of, of the Cambridge Springs. I hope you liked the video. Uh, let me know what you think. Let me know what you think about the Cambridge Springs. This is an opening I'm going to be playing myself. Uh, I've started working on it, well, in detail to prepare it for my own games and I quite like it. Uh, thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more chess. Thank you for watching the Queen's Gambit Decline series. Uh, if you haven't seen all the videos, uh, watch them. You might find the variation like more. I have covered almost everything uh, that's good for black. Thanks. Bye.